In the beginning, there were the five studios, Paramount, MGM, Warner Brothers, RKO, and 20th Century Fox. These studios not only controlled the production and distribution of all major motion pictures made in the United States, but they also owned and operated the theaters in which those movies were shown, controlled the film processing laboratories, and kept directors, actors, and other crew on tight contractual leashes. In 1948, however, the United States Supreme Court affirmed a lower court decision that the Hollywood studio system was an oligopoly in violation of antitrust laws, and that the Big Five needed to break up their vertically integrated business model to allow for more competition. Thus was born the American Independent Film. After 1953's independently produced and distributed Little Fugitive won international awards and helped inspire the likes of Francois Truffaut and the French New Wave, Hollywood knew it needed to find a way to counter the growing market for smaller, more artistically driven movies. So the 50s saw a boom in sweeping cinematic epics with bloated budgets and an intense focus on spectacle. However, throughout the 1960s, the big budget epics began to wane in popularity, and a few high profile flops made them too risky to rely on so Hollywood changed tactics. The studios started giving money to young filmmakers with artistic visions under promises to let them make whatever they wanted, no matter how experimental. Thus was born the American New Wave. In an underground society dominated by rigid social control, THX 1138 is beginning to feel emotions for the first time in his life. He is learning about love, jealousy, and anger. Before long, he is caught and captured for his transgressions, and he must find a way to break free to see if he can find freedom above ground. Before we go any further, if you could hit that like button, blessings of the state be upon you. If you really are a subject of the divine, don't forget to subscribe as well. Let me be thankful in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. Struggling to make money off of bigger productions, Warner Brothers, in 1967, decided to produce the long gestating film version of the popular musical Finian's Rainbow, with a reduced budget. One way they saved money was by hiring as director the UCLA Wunderkind Francis Ford Coppola. During production, an up-and-coming USC star, George Lucas, who had made a big splash in the academic world with his short film Electronic Labyrinth THX 1138 4EB, was given a six-month, all-expense-paid internship at Warner Brothers, and he came to the set of Finian's Rainbow and began giving Coppola ideas. Coppola, impressed with Lucas's insights, let him help throughout the rest of the film's production. Not long after, Coppola decided to make his own independent film, The Rain People, starring James Caan and Robert Duvall, and George Lucas was one of the few people he brought along with him, promising him that, as they traveled the country to make Coppola's movie, Lucas would be afforded plenty of time to write an independent movie of his own, a feature-length version of Electronic Labyrinth THX 1138 for EB. Electronic Labyrinth had originally been based on a story idea for a short film called Breakout about an underground surveillance state, written by Lucas's classmates Matthew Robbins and Walter Murch, who dropped the project in favor of something else and gave Lucas permission to make it himself. When he set about expanding it to feature length though, Lucas, who had never written a screenplay, had difficulty writing it. With a first draft that he and Coppola agreed needed a lot of work, Lucas got in touch with Walter Murch and had him help work on a second draft, which became the final version of the script. As principal photography on The Rain People came to an end, Coppola and Lucas, along with a select handful of like-minded filmmakers including Merch, founded their own production company based in San Francisco, American Zoetrope. After finishing the post-production on The Rain People, the first film on the fledgling company's slate was Lucas's film, the title of which had been shortened to just THX 1138. They then secured funding from Warner Brothers, which was eager to take advantage of the already legendary and youthful talents of both Coppola and Lucas, 
and in September of 1969, after Warner Brothers signed off on the screenplay, production on THX 1138 began on a budget of $777,777.77, a nod to Coppola's belief in the lucky number seven. Principal photography took less than two months, with a lot of guerrilla-style filmmaking in multiple locations throughout San Francisco, including the still-under-construction Bay Area Rapid Transit System, the Caldecott Tunnel, the Marin County Civic Center, a Pacific Bell switch room, and a nuclear power plant. Most of the pre-production, including most of the location scouting and casting, had already been finished by Lucas before the budget had even been secured, which helped to accelerate proceedings. Lucas, a fan of Akira Kurosawa, had originally wanted to film in Japan, the land of consumerism and social regimentation, but after visiting the country and learning of the difficulties, not to mention the cost, and getting permission to film there, that idea had to be scrapped. The title role was given to Robert Duvall, who had starred in The Rain People and had always been Lucas's first choice. As a character actor who'd had roles in To Kill a Mockingbird, Bullet, and True Grit, he was eager to play the lead and was intrigued by the project as Lucas had described it to him. To play opposite him in the role of S.E.N., Lucas wanted a well-trained but relatively inexpensive character actor, and he settled on Donald Pleasance, known at the time for his roles in The Great Escape, Fantastic Voyage, and You Only Live Twice. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Ernst Stavro Blofeld. The female lead, L.U.H., was a bit trickier. Lucas wanted somebody who could be vulnerable and strong, while also being attractive with a shaved head. A few actresses turned down the part before Lucas found Maggie McComey, a relatively unknown stage actress. For the holographic SRT, Robert Duvall recommended Don Pedro Colley, who got the part. Minor roles were also given to Sid Haig, who plays the Hansi prisoner NCH, David Ogden Steers, who voices the narrator, the incredibly prolific Ian Wolfe as prisoner PTO, and a handful of improvisational comedians, including Henry Jacobs, who provides the voice in almost all of the dialogue for one of the two off-screen technicians in this scene. That's it. Okay, now watch that reading, and is it... Uh -oh. Watch the needle on five now. Watch this. This knob is loose. Oh. One cameo that is impossible to really notice is the original story's writer, Matthew Robbins, who doubles for Robert Duvall in the final shot of the film. For the extras, they hired patients from a drug rehab center called Synanon, who had no problems shaving their heads and walking around aimlessly as though heavily medicated. Not long after THX 1138, Synanon became the more cult-like Church of Synanon, which was permanently shut down in 1991 after being at the center of numerous controversies and lawsuits, which included a few acts of violence, murder, and even terrorism. Ironically, the Church of Synanon, which started to require shaved heads for its members, began to feel a little too close to the society scene in THX 1138. Once principal photography was completed, Coppola gave Lucas a whole year to do the post-production. George Lucas edited the film himself in his attic, with Walter Murch coming in at nights to do the sound. They had no delusions about the kind of film they were making. Lucas, a fan of Jean-Luc Godard and the French New Wave, was trying to make an abstract avant-garde movie, utilizing deliberately disorienting techniques like atmospheric, subliminal storytelling, off-kilter framing, violations of the 180-degree rule, and static cameras. And he knew that if the studio backers saw what he was doing, they would have stopped him. He told himself he didn't particularly care if he broke into Hollywood writ large, that if the movie turned out to be a disaster, he could always do other things with his life. Lucas knew this was his one chance to do something bold and daring, and he wasn't about to squander the opportunity by trying to please the men he and Coppola had all but hoodwinked into financing it. When Warner Brothers finally saw the first cut of the film, they were dismayed at its experimental nature, and they tried to make changes to make it more commercial. They toyed with drastically recutting the film, but after several prolonged, heated arguments between the studio, Coppola, and Lucas, Warner Brothers ultimately only made a few minor edits, if only to assert their will over a film they felt was doomed. Though they decided to distribute it, they did demand that Coppola give all of the money back. THX 1138 released in March of 1971 with very little fanfare, to mixed reviews and poor sales. It made $945,000 in rentals, which while slightly profitable, was deemed a massive failure by Warner Brothers. 
The failure of THX 1138, whether on its own merits or because of Warner Brothers' unenthusiastic distribution, almost sunk American Zoetrope, and with it, the careers of both Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas. However, right before THX hit theaters, Paramount had hired Coppola to direct The Godfather. Coppola wasn't particularly interested in the project, but Lucas convinced him to do it, if only to save American Zoetrope. Needless to say, The Godfather did save the company, as well as the reputations of its founders. To be fair, THX 1138 is a bleak, unrelenting little film that isn't going to resonate with everybody. It deals in a lot of heady sociological issues, trying in its own way to reflect the anxieties of the late 60s and early 70s, things like the growing surveillance state, rampant consumerism, authoritarianism, and McCarthyism. Even though George Lucas approached things from a distinctly left-of-center direction, the movie doesn't have an overtly partisan political message. Indeed, in addition to being critical of right-wing political views, it can also be read as being anti-communist, with its uniforms, oppressive conformity, focus on employment for everyone, and anti-individualism. As such, it presents a dystopia that isn't afraid to come from multiple directions, and it paints a portrait of a world where society itself has become the main oppressor. There is no central antagonist, as Lucas was intent on showing a kind of emergent bureaucratic system – think Brave New World meets Cube – not the fruits of any individual evil or societal ill. It is this that THX must escape, and that's the central thread that carries the entire film – the idea of breaking free, of choosing the freedom of the unknown over the oppression of security. The movie plots a series of escapes from philosophical stagnation, from prison, and ultimately from the city itself. Another useful way to look at it is that the world of THX 1138 has itself become a machine, with its inhabitants mere cogs. THX has been awakened, a living thing looking around at the wires and mechanisms and deciding that there must be something better. In this scene, where characters are coyly named after philosophers like Plato and Sartre and where SEN speaks in Nixon quotes, We need descent. We need a creative descent. THX realizes that he is in a prison without walls that all he has to do to assert himself is to simply walk out. One thing about its design aesthetic that would prove to be particularly influential is dubbed by Lucas as used futurism, the idea that technology is never completely replaced, that it isn't anachronistic to mix the old and the new. He wanted everything to look worn, as though people really live and work in this universe. This aesthetic would reappear not only in Star Wars, but also in several other films, most prominently Ridley Scott's pair of influential sci-fi classics Alien and Blade Runner. THX 1138 isn't just an essential science fiction film, though. It also serves as a landmark in the history of film itself, an early example of what we now call independent filmmaking, even though it was financed by a major Hollywood studio. It convinced dozens of other young filmmakers that they could succeed without being beholden to studio mandates and Hollywood cliches, that with a camera, a vision, and a little bit of chutzpah, anyone can make a film. And that's all for today, fellow Earthlings. What do you think of THX 1138? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you'd like to support what I do even more, head on over to my Patreon to get access to bonus videos, vote on future topics, and more. You can also check out my website at emagill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more sci-fi classics in both film and literature. Until next time, though, when we'll search for a place to put this katra, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody.
straight forward and plain as the nose on your face. 